Unlike other serial killers, he was considered an anomaly, a maniac who didn't fit the typical profile of a bloodthirsty, evil, uncontrollable murderer. Instead, he was someone who sincerely felt remorse and wished to remain locked away for life, wanting to prevent harm to anyone else. He cried out for help, yet no one came to his aid. What in his life made him the way he became? Let's delve into the story of a man let down by estranged parents, a troubled upbringing, and a flawed law enforcement system. This is the tale of a serial killer known as the Deranged Dave. David Edward Moust was born on April 5, 1954, in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, to George and Ava Moust. Apart from David, the family had three other children. The family's life was challenging. Both George and Ava had difficult childhoods themselves. His father was put up for adoption at the age of 12, and thus the parents didn't know how to create a loving home for their own children. George was often absent from home, trying to stay away from his wife, who required constant attention, was emotionally unstable and self-centered. Right after the birth of David's younger brother Jeffrey, their mother was hospitalized for a month due to a nervous breakdown. It's possible she suffered from postpartum depression, but at that time, Medicine didn't have much understanding or help for women in such conditions. In 1963, when David was only seven years old, his parents divorced. Evidently, the divorce was initiated by David's father, as he had stopped supporting his ex-wife and the four children for a year, leaving the woman to take care of the family on her own. David's sister later recalled that life at their parents' home was difficult for all the children, but David had it the hardest. Perhaps because he bore a strong physical resemblance to his father, and since their mother despised her ex-husband, her hatred transferred onto her son. Eva claimed she couldn't control the boy. Allegedly, by the age of eight, David had tried twice to kill his brother Jeffrey, once by pushing him into the water in a lagoon and stepping on his fingers so he couldn't climb out, and another time by attempting to set Jeffrey's bed on fire. His mother also claimed she often checked her son's pockets because he might have stolen things from other people. According to her, he would steal her valuables and sell them, all of which supposedly occurred before he turned nine. Because when he turned nine, Eva declared that she no longer wanted to deal with a difficult, problematic child. She approached the court, stating that she needed help because he was mentally ill, and the nine-year-old child was admitted to an institution for the mentally ill. However, the staff and doctors noticed no signs of behavior as described by Ava. Rather, they concluded that the mother had simply abandoned her son. If life at home was already difficult for the boy, it became even worse. He had to share common spaces with dozens of other people, patients with schizophrenia, developmental disorders, and aggressive criminals. David felt anger and incomprehension. He felt he had nowhere to go because both his father and mother had abandoned him, and he found himself trapped. On visitation days, he stood by the window hoping to see his mother, who never appeared. The institution's staff tried to console him, making excuses for why his mother wasn't there, claiming she was unwell or had some other reason for not showing up. After some time, the boy resigned himself to his situation. He and the other children simply imagined that their parents needed a break. In reality, they hadn't been abandoned. In David's case, it didn't resemble the truth, but partly, the children were right. During those times, such institutions were used, as horrifying as it may sound, to essentially leave a child there. David later recalled a boy who regularly spent summers at the clinic because his parents sent him to the mental institution, treating it as a summer camp while they themselves went on vacation. Miraculously, when they returned from vacation, their son somehow recovered from his mental illness. Doctors quickly assessed how intelligent David was. He always articulated his thoughts clearly and demonstrated exceptional abilities, vividly recalling sporting events. Because of this, the medical staff soon suspected that it was Ava, David's mother, who suffered from a mental disorder, not her son. They waited for her to get better so they could send David back home. However, every time they tried to organize the child's return home, his mother rejected him. When the boy turned 13, the clinic staff had no choice but to officially acknowledge that David had no mental abnormalities. However, he still had nowhere to go. Consequently, he was transferred to a children's home located just a few blocks away from his family's home. It must have been very painful for him to realize that his relatives lived nearby but didn't want anything to do with him. However, David found himself in a shelter with other boys going through adolescence. And since they didn't have the opportunity to interact with the opposite sex, it was quite natural for them to experiment in relationships with each other. 
As soon as David appeared in the children's home, another boy began demanding his attention. He was very persistent and blackmailed David by threatening to tell everyone about his stay in the mental institution. David resisted, but later in his diary, he would write that he gave in and kissed the young blackmailer, after which he immediately felt disgust and anger towards himself. Except for this incident, David settled quite well into the shelter. David Moust was inherently very intelligent, and even with the hardships he faced, his difficult childhood, time in the clinic, and the shelter, they couldn't affect his ability to learn. He didn't lose concentration and impressed others with his phenomenal memory. Life seemed to be improving, until suddenly, a feeling of rage began to awaken within him. By the age of 15, David assaulted another boy, Eddie. They were playing together when, for unknown reasons, David started to choke Eddie. Eddie nearly died, but David suddenly stopped upon realizing that Eddie was almost not breathing. He asked for forgiveness, and Eddie forgave him. Was this repentance sincere? It's unclear as David may not have wanted trouble having nowhere else to go and trying to control himself. However, we know about this incident because he described it in his 87-page diary that he wrote in prison. Nonetheless, his self-control did not last long, as David soon attempted to strangle another boy, Daniel. They were in a room together simply watching TV when David grabbed a rope and wrapped it around Daniel's neck. Again, he stopped when he realized Daniel hadn't done anything wrong to him. I told myself enough, released the rope, and Daniel fell to the floor, he wrote in the diary. It was as if I was trapped inside myself and someone else was trying to kill Daniel, and I couldn't stop. He was contemplating his actions, convincing himself that it was wrong. David began to think that he couldn't control his actions or thoughts, which was probably terrifying for a teenager whose life lacked a normal parental model. Daniel survived but reported the incident, leading David to be returned to the institution for the mentally ill. Life seemed to promise improvement when the teenager turned 17. Along with a few other guys, he escaped from the clinic and decided to return home. To his immense disappointment, Eva had gotten married and there was no place in her home for her unwanted son. Moreover, she told everyone that David was a disgrace to the family and even pretended that he had never existed. To get rid of him, she convinced him to join the army. It's important to understand that it was 1971, amid the Vietnam War. But perhaps, for the boy, it wasn't the worst option. To give him something to do in life, a place to live, and useful skills, his mother sent him to the recruiter. David was accepted into the army and sent to Frankfurt, Germany. He served as a cook at a military base where civilians also lived. Among them was 13-year-old James McLister, whom everyone called Jimmy. His parents worked as engineers on the base. David and Jimmy met at the bowling alley. In the army, David discovered another talent. He played bowling superbly, participated in competitions, and earned decent money from it. David and Jimmy became friends and hung out until one evening. David woke up in his bed, naked with Jimmy. He erupted in anger. He suggested Jimmy go for a ride on a moped. Obviously, the boy trusted him completely, regarded him as an older brother, and fearlessly went along. If only he knew what David was thinking. They drove quite far from the base and reached a place where there remained a crater from a bomb from World War II. There, David tied Jimmy to a tree and beat him with a plank he found there. When Jimmy stopped breathing, his killer simply untied the body and left it there. David returned to the base and pretended as if nothing had happened. Of course, they searched for the boy but found him only a month later. David was detained but somehow convinced the court that it was an unfortunate accident. Supposedly, the boys damaged the moped and Jimmy crashed from it. David got scared, didn't know what to do, and just hid Jimmy's body. He was believed there was no evidence of murder, and David was sentenced to three years in prison. Interestingly, in prison, David behaved perfectly, earned a diploma, wrote to his family every week, and acquired new useful skills. His behavior was so exemplary that he was allowed to be considered for early release on parole, but he declined the offer. The young man began to understand what he was capable of and was afraid to be free. In confinement, he had plenty of time to reflect on what he had done, and he realized that if he were released, he would definitely kill someone else. He despised himself for such thoughts and feelings because they caused him revulsion. His lawyer later called him one of the most remarkable serial killers because he had a conscience. He felt sorry for killing people, sorry even until the moment when he killed again. He hated himself for what he had done. However, the thirst for murder returned, and he succumbed to it, killing again. 
It's a very peculiar pattern of behavior. Nevertheless, he was released in 1977 when he turned 23 years old. Two years later, he settled in Chicago and befriended a teenage boy. Well, befriended is how it seemed. But sometimes when the boy stayed overnight, David had the desire to stab him. After another evening when they drank and the teenager fell asleep on the couch, David gave in to this uncontrollable urge. He stabbed him in the abdomen with a knife, almost disemboweling him, but the teenager survived. David was tried for attempted murder. On the witness stand, he lied, and he was found not guilty. What he said to make them believe him remains unknown. Perhaps he had another talent, being devilishly convincing when necessary. By the age of 27, David had failed to learn how to control his desires. In an attempt to understand what was happening to him, he recalled the kiss at the orphanage when a boy approached him. He speculated that this negative intimate experience was the cause of his bad behavior. Therefore, he decided to find that boy, now a man, and kill him. He believed that by doing so, he could put an end to his destructive tendencies and desires. Thus, he set out on a hunt to direct his rage toward this man. However, upon arriving at the place where the boy used to live, he discovered that the man was in prison. So David wasn't the only one who, upon leaving that orphanage, ended up in trouble. He couldn't unleash his rage on his offender or suppress the urge to kill. Then, he spotted a boy, 15-year-old Donald Jones, completely innocent, who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, simply passing by his car. David convinced the teenager to get into the car under the guise of some simple, odd job and drove him to a remote area with quarries. Similar to his previous victim, he inflicted several stabs on Donald's abdomen. Later in his diary, he wrote about how the boy begged not to be killed, repeating, Don't kill me, I'm only 15 years old. However, David couldn't stop himself. He then took the teenager to the waterlogged part of the quarry where he left him. Unable to escape on his own, the teenager perished. David decided not to wait for the body to be discovered and left the town. He knew that his uncle lived in Galveston, Texas. His uncle allowed David to stay with him and found him work in his construction company. Again, David proved himself as an excellent worker, but his uncle fired him when he accidentally damaged the company's van. Things got worse. He invited a 14-year-old boy to his hotel room, offering alcohol and illegal substances, but instead began beating him. Suddenly he stopped. As if the normal David took over and caught himself in this horrible act, he dropped the weapon and burst into tears, feeling ashamed. The boy survived, and David received a five-year sentence. While in prison, he again thought that if released, he would continue killing. Investigators now started connecting him to the case of Donald, and in 1982, he was extradited to Chicago in connection with Donald Jones's murder. For a long time, they didn't find him fit to stand trial, returning him to a psychiatric clinic. However, after 10 years of awaiting trial, David admitted his guilt in 1994. He was sentenced to 35 years. The Cook County prosecutor wrote a report to the Illinois Department of Corrections, stating that he was the most dangerous inmate they would have. The sheriff even described him as a criminal equal to John Wayne Gacy. Nevertheless, due to David Moust waiting for trial and extradition for 12 years, his sentence was reduced by 12 years. Given his exemplary behavior as a prisoner, an additional two years were also deducted from his remaining sentence. David didn't want to be released and even wrote a six-page letter to the Illinois Department of Corrections admitting that he couldn't control himself, wanted to stay in prison, and asked not to be released. At that time, there was a law in Illinois that allowed a convicted person to voluntarily remain in prison for life as a sexually violent offender. David was offered this option and replied in the letter, bring the papers, I will sign everything, but nobody came to him. According to his lawyer, the letter wasn't even read, and in 1999, he was released from custody. After another release, David moved to Oak Park, Illinois. He hoped that a new place of residence would allow him to start over, but just a year later, he attacked his friend Anthony by hitting him on the back of the head with a metal pipe. One might think that this time the police would take more serious action against him. However, no charges were even brought against him because Anthony was a former gang member who didn't want to involve the police and refused to testify against David. In 2002, when his parole ended, David decided to move again, this time to Hammond, Indiana. He found a job nearby, often frequented by and involving teenagers. By then, employers could already check the backgrounds of those they hired. Despite David's history of victimizing teenagers, 
he was simply allowed to work alongside young boys. He quickly resumed his old habits, visiting places where teenagers hung out, such as public pools. He offered the boys opportunities to earn money by giving them seemingly simple tasks. No teenager would refuse to earn some money by doing a seemingly easy task, but these tasks turned out to be sinister. This continued until Michael Dennis, 13 years old, and James Ragagni, 16 years old, disappeared. David had met these boys that summer at the public pool and befriended them, inviting them over to his place. The last time they were seen was on September 10, 2003. When the boys vanished, the police initially assumed they might have just run away, especially considering Michael and James were rebellious. Therefore, the disappearance of these two boys didn't receive as much attention as the disappearance of 19-year-old Nick James on May 2, 2003. Nick James was not rebellious, and his family had been pressuring the police for several months. Investigators learned that he worked at a store with David Moust and checked his background. As they lacked evidence, they asked him to take a polygraph test, which he passed. He claimed not to have seen them for some time, which was essentially true. They didn't, however, ask if he had killed the boys. Despite passing the polygraph, investigators decided to search David's house. The officer with a canine, Emo, worked in 2003 with the purpose of finding bodies. The police invited the dog and its handler to search David Maust's basement. When the officer gave Emo the command, the dog began barking at the far wall of the basement, though it had been trained to act as if it were digging. The handler explained to investigators that this behavior was odd because the dog was doing something contrary to its training, but breaking the concrete and seeing what was behind it was necessary, as there must be a reason the dog wouldn't leave that particular spot. A week later, they were asked to return to the same house. Officers drilled a deep hole in the floor and found nothing. They circled to another side, drilled a longer hole, yet still found nothing. So they gave up. They asked them to return again with the dog. This time, Emo immediately approached the hole and lay down. The officer couldn't capture this on video and asked the handler to command the dog again. Then the dog moved to another hole and lay down once more. Police brought in a concrete specialist and found out David had used an enormous amount of concrete, around 80 bags or so. Obviously, this was done to hide something, presumably bodies. Finally, the police removed the concrete and found three bodies. David had suffocated James and Michael in his apartment and buried them under the basement with Nick. Suddenly, David's mother and brother, who had not spoken to him for many years, appeared. Jeffrey gave many interviews, questioning whether what happened could have been prevented if the police had paid attention to David earlier. He spoke about terrible things that his brother allegedly did in childhood, but he had no evidence. Moreover, his mother and brother, who had not communicated with David for many years, seemed to thirst for fame, and Jeffrey even wanted to write a book. His attorney, Thomas Wayne, stated that David was indeed a serial killer, but he wasn't born one. The attorney sincerely believed that if someone sought the recipe for creating a serial killer, then his childhood was precisely that. He never learned to live in society or communicate with other people. In November 2005, David pleaded guilty to the murders and was sentenced to three life imprisonments. In January 2006, at the age of 51, David passed away. A note was found in his cell where he confessed to five murders, including three in Hammond. He wrote how disappointed he was not to have been sentenced to death because he felt he deserved it. He believed that if he had been kept away from society, he wouldn't have committed as many crimes as he did. Additionally, he didn't want taxpayers to pay for his existence. He asked for forgiveness from the victim's families and took responsibility for everything he had done. He didn't blame his parents or upbringing, only himself. David wrote that he loved his family, but they never reciprocated.